this video, we're going to branch a little bit away from talking about specific nanograph science to instead talk about the exciting results of the BICEP2 experiment. The possible discovery of a signal within the cosmic microwave background that provides the first direct evidence of cosmic inflation, which occurred an incredibly short time after the very start of the Big Bang. We will discuss some of the details of this discovery, what they found, and what this amazing result means for our understanding of the universe. I will also post in the description a list of references that I used while preparing this video that I highly recommend for anyone who wants to read more on the subject. However, before we get into the details of this experiment, a cautionary note that should apply to any new discovery in physics. There is a saying that was made popular by the astronomer Carl Sagan that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The claim that, for the first time, a signal from the very first moments of the universe has been detected is certainly an extraordinary claim. It will be important to see if other groups involved in similar experiments get similar results. That being said, the evidence that the BICEP2 team has presented for their claim seems to be very strong. In their paper, they have gone to great lengths in considering possible sources of error, and they have even publicly released the data associated with this discovery so that other scientists can do their own analysis and check their work. So overall, it really looks like they have found something very important. So what exactly was done for the BICEP2 experiment? Well, the BICEP2 team used a state-of-the-art instrument to measure the polarization of light from the cosmic microwave background. So that sentence has a lot going on, so let's talk about each bit separately. So first, what does it mean for light to be polarized? Light, or electromagnetic waves, consists of a pair of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. These fields always oscillate at 90 degrees to each other and 90 degrees to the direction the wave is traveling in. But even with that restriction, there is still a freedom in whether, say, the electric field is oscillating up or down, or side to side, or at some angle in between. The polarization of light is simply defined to be the direction that the electric field is oscillating in. So for these two light rays, even though they have the same intensity and the same wavelength and frequency, since the orientation of the electric field is different, they have different polarizations. A lot of the time, the light that we see, say from a normal light bulb, is made of a random mixture of all sorts of different polarizations, so we call it unpolarized. But when, for instance, unpolarized light is reflected off of a surface, the reflected light will tend to be polarized in a direction parallel to that surface. This is actually why sunglasses can help reduce glare. A good pair of sunglasses has a polarized filter in them that only let through vertically polarized light. So the scattered light that has a horizontal polarization, this strong source of glare, is blocked by the sunglasses and we can see things more easily. Now, the key point of all of this is that the polarization of light can affect how light is scattered by particles. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But for now, let's change gears and talk about the cosmic microwave background or CMB. And to do this, let's talk a little bit about the Big Bang Theory. So as a very brief overview, about 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was in a very hot and very dense state and space-time itself expanded and eventually the universe was able to cool as space expanded and clouds of dust and gas were able to collapse under gravity to form stars and galaxies and eventually planets and us. But for the first 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was so hot and dense that it was just filled with a hot plasma of free electrons and protons that light couldn't pass through. If light was emitted, it would just be scattered by an electron and then run into another electron and just keep bouncing through this plasma, never making it very far. However, as the universe expanded and cooled, the protons and electrons that made up this plasma began to bind together to form neutral hydrogen. And this no longer interacted with the light, so at that point, the universe became transparent. 
This happened around 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The light that was bouncing around scattered one last time, and then the universe became transparent, so this light was able to continue freely through the universe almost unimpeded. And when we look around the sky in the microwave band, we can actually see this radiation that was left over from the Big Bang. It's the afterglow of the Big Bang, and it contains information regarding what the state of the universe was at this point of last scattering, almost 13.8 billion years ago. Now, this radiation is almost completely uniform across the entire sky, other than some very tiny temperature differences shown in this map of the CMB radiation from the Planck mission. These temperature differences are on the order of one part in 10,000. So it's almost completely uniform other than these tiny oscillations. In addition to these tiny temperature fluctuations, there is also a very tiny amount of polarization in the CMB radiation, which also contains information about this early state of the universe. So where does this CMB polarization come from? Well, let's look at what would happen to a free electron that's in this plasma just before the universe became transparent and how that interacts with a ray of light. So let's consider a source of light over here that's emitting unpolarized light. So there's equal amounts of vertically and horizontally polarized light. And we're gonna look at what light is scattered by the electron in this particular direction, kind of the outgoing direction, kind of coming out of the screen. Well, when the horizontally polarized light hits this electron, it's gonna cause the electron to oscillate in this direction. And with that direction of oscillation, it's actually not going to scatter any light in this same direction. It's gonna scatter light up into this and to this side, but it won't scatter any light in that direction, again, from the horizontally polarized light. But when this vertically polarized light hits the electron, that's gonna make the electron scatter or oscillate up and down, and that will scatter some vertically polarized light in this direction. So the horizontally polarized light doesn't get scattered, the vertically polarized light does get scattered with this particular configuration and scattering in this particular direction. But that's not gonna be the only source of light that's hitting this electron. Maybe we have another source of light that is above the electron and sending, again, unpolarized light downwards. Well, in this case, the polarization represented here is not going to be scattered in this direction, but the polarization uh, that is in this direction is going to make the electron oscillate again, and that will scatter horizontally polarized light in this particular direction. So if these two sources of light have the same intensity, then the same amount of horizontal and vertically polarized light will be emitted. But let's say, for example, let's say this light is being emitted by some gas that is hot, and the light over here is being emitted by some gas that is cold, or at least not as hot as this one. Well, in that case, the amplitude of the radiation coming out of the hot gas is going to be significantly larger than the radiation that is emitted from the cold gas. So the vertically polarized light that is scattered is greater than the horizontally polarized light that is scattered from this cold cloud. So what we get overall is that the scattered light has a net polarization, in this, in this case in the vertical direction, and it is all because the temperatures of these regions are different in different directions. And this occurred when the cosmic microwave background formed. In this plasma, there were some very, very tiny temperature differences, temperature anisotropies, and that imbued this CMB light with some polarization. And it's polarization like this that the BICEP2 team wanted to measure. So let's have a look at the uh, instrument they used. Uh, this is the BICEP2 telescope, and it is specifically designed to measure polarization in the cosmic microwave background. 
and it's located at the South Pole where the extremely cold and dry air as well as the high altitude are optimal for observing the CMB radiation. If you want to observe the polarization of the CMB, the South Pole is the best place on Earth to do it. So between 2010 and 2012, this instrument scanned a relatively empty patch of sky, and they did this so that there was a minimal amount of light from other sources like our own galaxy or, or nearby clusters of galaxies. We just wanted to see the light from the cosmic microwave background. And they measured the net polarization from each tiny patch of sky. So on the maps that they made of the polarization, in each direction of the sky, you draw a little line segment. And that line segment corresponds to the polarization of that part of the CMB. Now, on these polarization maps, we can find two kinds of patterns. And we refer to these two patterns as either E modes or B modes. Now, the E mode pattern looks something like this. All of the polarization directions seem to be coming out of a central point or they can be going directly around a central point. And the B modes are a little bit different as they have a bit of a twisted shape to them. So that would be one of the B modes that you can have and this is the other B mode that you can have. And there's actually a mathematical way of, for any polarization map, of determining how much E modes you have and how many B modes you have. And these are the polarization results of the BICEP2 experiment. This is how much of an E mode signal they found. The reds and blues correspond to how much of each of these two signals they got and their B mode, the B mode signal that they found. Again, reds and blues correspond to uh, the direction of this curled pattern. Now, the reason that we break up our polarization map into these two modes is because the E mode patterns and the B mode patterns are produced by different physical mechanisms in the cosmic microwave background. For example, if we think of the plasma in the early universe, it was almost completely smooth, but there were some small density fluctuations or density waves that would have produced different temperatures in that early plasma. So when the light that was bouncing around in the plasma was finally able to escape, that last scattered light was near these temperature anisotropies, and that means that they would get some kind of polarization associated with them. And it turns out that these density waves will only produce E modes uh, in the CMB radiation. So these E modes were first detected in the CMB a few years ago. However, these density waves will not produce any B modes. But when we look at the map that the BICEP2 team has released, we see that although the B modes are a fair bit weaker than the E mode signals, they did still find this B mode pattern. And the question is, what could produce this signal? Well, there are a few ways that this E signal could turn into a B signal as the light from the cosmic microwave background propagated through the universe and past other galaxies. There's a way to get some of this B signal out of that. But the real exciting possibility and what the BICEP2 team is claiming is the primary source of these B-mode signals is gravitational waves that were produced during inflation in the very early universe. So that's what they're saying these B-modes are coming from. Primordial gravitational waves from the inflationary period of the universe. So this is another sentence that has a lot going on. So let's again look at it piece by piece. So very briefly, gravitational waves are ripples in the curvature of space-time. And if a gravitational wave is propagating in a certain direction, they propagate at the speed of light and can basically pass through anything so they're not uh, blocked by the plasma in the early universe. But as this gravitational wave moves by, it will actually distort space-time, repeatedly stretching and squeezing space in alternating directions. And this distortion of space-time 
affects how light propagates through that space-time. So from the perspective of an electron that has this gravitational wave passing by, it will actually see the radiation coming from different regions as being either hotter or colder based on this stretching of space-time. And that will allow the gravitational wave to cause this polarization effect because the electron is seeing this hot and cold pattern. And the specific way in which the electron sees this hot and cold pattern and produces this polarization will not only produce E modes in the CMB, but also produce B mode patterns that do not get produced directly by density fluctuations. In order to produce these kinds of patterns, you would actually need a fairly strong source of gravitational waves. Stronger, in fact, than you would get from at least the most basic model of the Big Bang alone. However, if in the very er early universe, there was a period of exponential expansion, a period known as inflation, then we could get a strong source of gravitational waves. And we'll talk a little bit more about what inflation is, and what evidence the BICEP2 team has found to support inflation in the next video.